on the month of Muharram, uh, this is a sacred month. Uh, this is a month in which we should remember the struggles of the family of the Prophet Sallallahu because they were in his footsteps. The struggles of the Ahlul Bayt Rasulillahi alayhim was salam is extremely important for us as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. This is something that is foundational in our religion. And I think it's a great unifying factor, a great unifying force of all Muslims. Imam Malik ibn Anas, عنه, his judgment on jidal bayn al-awam, that polemical discourse or debate amongst lay Muslims, amongst the laity, he said it's haram. And you go into certain masajid or MSAs, you see people, students who have no requisite knowledge, debating in a polemical type of way, making takfir of each other about Ash'ari, Maturidi, and Sunni, and Shi'i, and Salafi, and Wahhabi. According to Imam Malik, this is haram, this type of discourse. Now, does that mean that we can't have dialogue? We should have dialogue, right? Something like this should take place in a masjid, right? This is tasawwuf. Tasawwuf is just a technical term for ihsan, right? Ihsan is in the Quran. Inna Allah yuhibbul muhsineen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the muhsineen. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked about ihsan in hadith, Jibreel, sound hadith, Sahih Bukhari. What did he say? An ta'abud Allah ka'annaka tara. To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as though you see him. And if, and if you don't see him, then know, be cognizant that indeed he sees you. To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if raptured in the beatific vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the prophetic way of worship. This is how the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As if he was standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine the scene on the Yawm al-Qiyamah. When the Jahannam is brought near and we're going to see it with Ayn al-Yaqeen according to the Quran. How would you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? On that day, this is the prophetic worship. This is the worship, the ibadah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. To have this type of dhuq, Imam Ghazali talks about it. He calls it dhuq, to taste the faith. And he criticized the formalists who are changing definitions. Even at his time, he says they're changing definitions. The word fiqh has a different definition at his time than it did with the salaf. The, the word fiqh at the time of Imam Ghazali just meant how to make wudu and how to make hajj and things like that. What does fiqh mean? Fiqh means the essence of the religion. It's the essence. In this sense, all of the sahaba were fuqaha in this sense. There's different types. Obviously, there's a jurisprudential aspect of fiqh, and that's very important. But fiqh literally means a deep understanding of the religion, to taste the essence of the religion, to have tahqiq, actualize the religion. Like Hanzala came to Abu Bakr Siddiq and he said, Asbahtu munafiqan, I've become a munafiq. And Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, why do you say this about yourself? And he said, because when I, am, when I sit in the majlis of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I have tahqiq, I, I have dhuq, I taste my faith, to paraphrase what he said. I have a strong spirituality. He talks about Jannah and Nar. And I have this really strong spirituality. Then I leave his presence and it starts to wane. And I go back to how I was. I've become a munafiq. This is when he said. And Abu Bakr Sadiq said, that happens to me too. Let's go ask the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, no, you haven't become a munafiq. If you were to remain in that state as you are in my presence, then you'd be shaking hands with angels in the street. Right? But we should have a dialogue about these things. Abu Qasim al-Junayn, Qadza sallahu sirra, he said that our knowledge, ilmuna muqayyidun bi kitabi Allah wa sunnatu rasulihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the great articulators of tasawwuf, of ihsan, of Islamic spiritualism, Islamic mysticism. He said our knowledge is nothing more than knowledge that is tied to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's not coming out of nowhere, it's not bid'ah, it's not taken from Christianity, it's not taken from Hinduism. Right? There were things that were borrowed, there's no doubt about it as far as practices go. But the aqidah, from a standpoint of creed, this is based firmly in the Quran and Sunnah of the Messenger. So to begin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, This is an imperative command. Say to them, No reward do I ask of you for this except that you love 
the Qurba, who is Qurba? According to the vast majority of exegetes of the Quran, this is a reference to the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are commanded in the Quran to love the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In a famous line of poetry by Abu Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, a great scholar of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, says, Ya ala bayti Rasulillah, hubbukum fardun min Allahi fi al-kitab. O oh, family of the Messenger of God, your love is obligatory, incumbent upon us from Allah based in the Kitab, based in the Quran. Man lam yusalli alaykum la salata la. Whoever doesn't send benedictions upon you in the prayer, there is no prayer for him. Imam Shafi'i considered it a rukun, a pillar of the salah that you send benedictions of peace upon the Prophet and his family, or else your prayer doesn't count. Right? Mujtahid of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this demonstrates the greatness of a salah ala nabi, of benedictions upon the Prophet that this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Rabbu samawati wal ard. Khaliku kulli shay'in. The one who created everything is engaged in this activity. Sending blessings of peace upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Inna Allah wa malaikatuhu. And the angels also are sending blessings of peace upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet there are some Muslims who say, don't overpraise the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is it possible to overpraise? We talked about this last night. Is it even possible? Right? As one of the scholars said, one of the poets said, Wallahu qad athna alayhi. Fama yusawi al qawla minna aw yakunu thanana. If Allah praises him, what is our praise in comparison? And the ulama used the analogy of putting a needle into the ocean and extracting the needle. And then comparing the water in the ocean with the water on the needle. Can you overpraise the Prophet ﷺ? Fa'inna fadla rasulillahi laysa lahu had. Umam Buseri says in the famous ode to the cloak, the burda, that there is no end to the praiseworthy attributes of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's hadith regarding this. Ubay bin ibn Ka'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How much of my daily benedictions should I, should I spend on blessings upon you? Ruba'an, he said a quarter of it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, good, that's good, but more is better. He said, nisfahu. Half of it, that's good, but more is better. Thalatha arba. Three quarters of it, that's good, but more is better. Kullahu. All of my adhkar is as salah ala nabi. That's good. This is what the Prophet ﷺ told him. He didn't say, astaghfirullah, the shirk, bid'ah. No. Kufur, no. The Prophet ﷺ is teaching his sahaba. If all of your adhkar, all of your adhkar is as salah ala nabi, that's good. And there's no way you can overpraise the Prophet ﷺ. Except if you say something, that is categorically, that is categorically rejected in the Quran or in the Hadith. لا تتوروني كما أتى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Right? It's Hadith of Tirmidhi. It's quoted by our brethren all the time. Don't flatter me like the Christians have flattered Isa عليه السلام. كما the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uses the particle of comparison كما. What does كما mean? Like they have done. So what is rejected in the Quran? Categorically rejected. The Christians say, what about Isa عليه السلام? They say he's Ibn Allah. We don't say that about the Prophet ﷺ. They say, he is Allah. Inna Allah huwa al-Masih ibn Maryam. This is what they say. Nobody is saying this about the Prophet ﷺ. Right? So we have to understand, when, when he says, ﷺ, don't do to me what the Christians did with their Prophet, what did the Christians do to their Prophet? You have to understand what they did. That's rejected in the, in the Quran. In something that is dalil qat'i. But sending blessings of peace upon the Prophet, that's only a good thing. The brother recited the, the hadith. Man salla alayya wahida sallallahu alayhi ashara. It's only for our benefit. Whoever sends blessings of peace upon me once, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends blessings of peace upon him ten times. Ten times. There is sound hadith, ajib hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna inda ra'si malakun yuballighuni salata alayya min ummati. There is an angel, he's talking about his time in the grave, in the barzakh. There, there is... An angel seated at my head who conveys salams to me from my nation. He's telling you so and so is making salam to you, Ya Rasulullah. An angel. This is what he says. Sound hadith of Al Bazar. This sound hadith. Illa yomul jumu'ati fa asma'u bi udhuni wa aradu bi lisani aw kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. Except on Friday, I can hear it with my ear. 
Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Allah is, is powerful, He's omnipotent. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to make His Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hear something in the qabr, very easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Inna Allah yusmi'u ma yasha. In the Quran, Allah causes to hear whomever He wills. Tu'radu alayya a'malakum. Hadith ibn Hibban. Sound hadith. Tu'radu alayya a'malakum. Your, your deeds are presented to me. Yom al Khamis on Friday. Does that mean the Prophet ﷺ judges our deeds? No, don't put words into his mouth. ﷺ. This is haram. Denying what he said is also haram. Whatever he offers you, you take it. You don't deny it. You take it. This is what he said. This is a sahih hadith. Rigorously authenticated hadith that your deeds are presented to me on Thursday. If I see good, I praise Allah. And if I see other than that, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness for you. He's rahmatil alameen. His life does not end at death. Death is not annihilation. This is not Hinduism. Death is not, he's not, it's not over at his passing from this dunya. He continues to be rahmatil alameen. Continues to be rahmatil alameen. So, a few hadith I want to mention here with regards to love of Ahlul Bayt. The Prophet said, Addibu awladakum ala thalath. Of your riwayah, Allimu awladakum thalatha khisal. Discipline your children upon three things, or teach your children three things. Hubbu nabiyikum, the love of your Prophet, wa hubbu ahli baytihi, and the love of his family, wa ara qira'atil Quran, and the reading, understanding of the Quran. He said in the hadith Tirmidhi, Ahibbu Allah lima yugdukum bihi min ni'mihi. Love Allah for his blessings upon you. If we just contemplate, one of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will necessarily engender love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, someone sees us on the street, a perfect stranger comes up to us and gives us $1,000 in cash. Imagine how appreciative you'd be. Here's a gift for you. I don't even know you. Here's $1,000. Your heart might actually incline towards that person. You might have love for that person. So a complete stranger who just gave you some cash, you might actually love that person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you your life. Your, your children, your parents, the air you breathe, your grandchildren, your, your grandparents, everything Allah gave you, just contemplate that, it will engender necessarily love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what the Prophet is saying. Love Allah for His blessings upon you. And love me for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And love my family for my sake. One of the companions asked the Prophet ﷺ after the latter part of that verse was revealed, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Right? Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Muhammad wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. They asked him, Kayfa nu salli alayk, Ya Rasulullah. How do we do that? How do we send benedictions upon, upon you? How do we pray upon you? And he said, say, قُلْ اللَّهُمَّ سَلِّ عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلَى آلِ مُحَمَّدْ Right? Send blessings of peace upon the Prophet ﷺ and the family of the Prophet ﷺ. So then the question arises, who are the Ahlul Bayt? Are the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, the Ummahatul Mu'mineen included in the Ahlul Bayt? There's difference of opinion. The dominant opinion, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, is that yes, one of the wider meanings of Ahlul Bayt includes the mothers of the believers, and there's a hadith of Zayd ibn Arkam, which makes that very, very clear, because there are some people who say it only includes the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there's a hadith I want to show you, or quote to you, a very interesting hadith, which shows the exalted status of Ahlul Bayt and identifies them very clearly. It's called Hadith Al-Kisa. This is in Muslim and Tabarani. It is a sound hadith, rigorously authenticated. So we are told that it's related by Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha, which she says that the Prophet sallallahu was in her quarters and he was sleeping on a kisa khaybari, like a sack or a cloth khaybari. And Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, she walks into the room and she has some sweets or some desserts or something, right? So the Prophet sallallahu tells her 
go get your husband and your children. So she goes and gets Imam Ali alayhi salam and Ahlul Sunnah, you can say alayhi salam for Ahlul Bayt. Imam Bukhari says in Sahih Bukhari, Fatima alayhi salam. Imam Bukhari says this. It's not bid'ah, not kufur, nothing like that. Okay? So go get Imam Ali. So he comes with Al Hassanain. Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. And they're sitting on this Kisa Khaybari. This is a sababun nuzul. This is the occasion of the revelation of the verse, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ma yuridullahu liyudhiba ankum rijza ahl al bayt, wa yutahirukum tathira. Allah only wants to remove every kind of stain from you, O people of the house, and to render you pure and spotless. The Prophet ﷺ, he takes the Kisa Khaybari and he puts it over his head and over the head of Fatima and Ali and Al Hassanain. He says, Allahumma ha'ula'i ahlu bayti. O oh Allah, this is the Ahlul Bayt. And then we're told in the hadith of Umm Salama, right? She wants to duck her head underneath the Kisa as well. And the Prophet says, Anti ila khair, you're okay, right? So the wider meaning of Ahlul Bayt, according to the ulama, includes the wives and the sons of Abbas and Ja'far and so on and so forth. But these five are definitely from Ahlul Bayt. Who are the five? The Prophet Wasallam, Imam Ali, al Hassanain, Fatima Az-Zahra, alayhim as salam. Now this is important. Another hadith called Hadith with Thaqalain. This is a very important hadith. This hadith is mutawatir. Mutawatir means it is the strongest type of hadith possible. Multiply attested hadith. The scholars of Al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah say that a hadith that is mutawatir is equal creedally and in its legislative capacity to a Quranic ayah. Right? Denial, in other words, of a mutawatir hadith is tantamount to denial of an ayah of the Quran. Dalil qat'i. And this is kufr. It's infidelity to deny a mutawatir hadith. Multiply attested. Groups and groups of people report this hadith from multiple countries, which would have made it impossible to fabricate the hadith. A factual statement. You find it in Muslim Ahmad Tirmidhi. So the, tr the transmission here is from Sahih Muslim. This riwayah, Zayd ibn Arkam. He says that on the way back from Hajjatul Wada, right, the final, pil the final pilgrimage, the farewell pilgrimage of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said they stopped at a place called Ghadir Khum, which there's a pond, there's some trees there, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he turns to the people and he says, "Inni tarikun fikum athqalain, I have left behind me two weighty things." Two weighty things. What are they? Kitab Allahi, Hablun Mamdudu Min Asamai Ila Al Ard. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is like your lifeline or your cable extension, extending from the heavens down to the earth. So the analogy is like you're in an ocean and you're drowning. And someone throws you a lifeline. Kitab Allah, Hablun Mamdudun Min Asamai Ila Al Ard. And number two, Itrati Ahlu Bayti. And number two, my family, the people of my house. Now there's another hadith that says, Kitab Allah wa Sunnati. Is this a contradiction? There's no contradiction. There's no contradiction. We'll talk about how to reconcile these two. Let's finish the riwayah though. In Sahih Muslim of Zayd ibn Arkam radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then the Prophet sallallahu said, wa innahuma lan yatafarraqa. That these two things, these thaqalain, they will never deviate from one another. They'll never be separated. They'll never contradict one another. The Ahlul Bayt will never go against the Quran or deviate the Quran. You will not understand the Quran without Ahlul Bayt. You will not understand Ahlul Bayt without the Quran. This is what it means according to the Muhaddithin of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Sunni ulama. And then he says, Alastu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim? Am I not over the believers? Don't you prefer me over yourselves? The Prophet ﷺ is saying, there's a reference to the verse in the Quran, and Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim, Surah Al Ahzab, ayah number six, that the believers prefer the life of the Prophet over their own life. You just read about Ghazwat Uhud, the men who surrounded the Prophet ﷺ, totally putting themselves in harm's way to defend the Prophet ﷺ. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, shooting arrows. People firing arrows at the Prophet from short distance and sat standing in front of them, firing arrows back at them. The Prophet said, 
Irmi ya Sa'ad, fidaka abi wa ummi. Throw your arrows, O Sa'ad. May my father and mother be ransom for you. This is what he said to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Imam Ali going around the Prophet وسلم, fighting off blades and arrows, like a moth going around a flame. That's all we have to read is some of these ghazawat of the Prophet وسلم, and we understand what that means. And Nabi awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. The woman who stood in front of Abdullah ibn Qami'ah, this man on a horse who wants to kill the Prophet وسلم, who had just killed Mus'ab ibn Umair at Ghazwat Uhud. And now this woman, Nusayba bintu Ka'b, she stands in front of his horse and she's standing there with a sword in her hand. She came to the, the Ma'rika to give water to the Mujahideen. But then the Prophet ﷺ is under siege. So she stands in front of this armed horseman. And he won't kill her because he has the decency not to kill a woman. Which is more than I can say about, you know, current rules of warfare. This man who just killed a Sahabi and now he's intentioned, he's resolved upon killing the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will not kill a woman on the battlefield. So he starts hitting her with his sword on her shoulder. He says, get out of the way. What are you doing here? Get out of the way. And she won't budge. She relates to the, the, the hadith. She said, I wanted to run, I, but I turned around and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is under siege. So I kept my ground. And then he brings the sword down hard on her shoulder and fractures her uh, clavicle and she falls down. And then her son, Zayd, runs to her defense, says, Ummi, Ummi, my mother. And what does she say to him? She says, go protect the Prophet. Don't worry about me. Protect the Prophet. He's angry with him. Why? The believers prefer the life of the Prophet over their own lives. You're not a complete believer unless you love the Prophet ﷺ more than yourself, more than your father, your son, and all of humanity. All of humanity. So this is what he says. Yes, yes. The Prophet ﷺ, he takes the hand of Sayyidina Ali. He says, Man kuntu mawla, fahada aliyun mawla. Hadith mutawatir. If I am your master, then this Ali is your master. Right? And then he says, Allahumma wali man wala, wa adi man aada, wansur man nasara, wa khdul man khadala. Oh Allah, befriend the one who befriends him, antagonize the one who antagonizes him, give victory to the one who gives him victory, forsake the one who forsakes him. Right? This is the exalted station of Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet. Right? And this doesn't in any way take away from the from the greatness of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Khalifa to Rasulullah, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. How much sacred knowledge was imparted to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, the best friend of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before Islam. This shows you the character of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, that this was his companion that he chose, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before the bi'atha, before the revelation came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Here we're, we're talking about the exalted status of Ahlul Bayt. So is there a contradiction here? Kitabullah wa sunnati, kitabullah wa itrati. There's no contradiction. Because according to scholars of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah, the true and authentic Sunnah has always been invested in Ahlul Bayt. This is why we should seek them out. Have a connection to Ahlul Bayt. Have connection with Ahlul Bayt. Because they are never going to be separated from the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ says in a hadith called Hadith, As-Safina, sound hadith, Al-Bazar, the Mustrak of Al-Hakim, the Mustad of Ahmad, Mathalu Ahli Bayti ka Mathali Safinati Nuh. The similitude of Ahli Bayt is like the ship of Noah. What is the ship of Noah? This is an interesting ta'wil of the Quran, an esoteric interpretation, right? That you have the exoteric meaning that this was a historical event that happened with Nuh alayhi salam in his qawm and he built a ship and there was a flood but the Prophet ﷺ is comparing this to something that's going to happen in the future. A typology, a foreshadowing. That my family is like the ship of Noah. Now there's no, there's no flood here. But there really is. There's no flood of waters. But there's a flood of confusion, of kufr, of nifaq, of, 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 of bid'ah. Right? Changing the sunnah. It's all over the world. What do we do in this situation? How do we understand the Qur'an? You understand the Qur'an by attaching yourself, clinging yourself to the ship 
of the Ahl al-Bayt. This is what the ulama say. Mathul Ahl al-Bayt, Mathul Safinati Nuh. Man rakiba ha faqad naja. Wa man takhallafa anna faqad halak. Aw kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. Whoever rides upon it, embarks upon it, is saved. Whoever does not, is destroyed. Nasallallahu alayhi wa salama. The true authentic sunnah has always been invested in the Ahl al-Bayt. In its outward and inward aspects. In the zahir and batin aspects. Umm Salama says in a hadith, Ali and the truth are inseparable. This hadith of Ahl al-Sunnah wa jamaah Ali, alayhi salam Karam Allahu wajha is inseparable, inseparable from the truth. Inseparable in another riwayah from the Qur'an. He's never going to deviate from the Qur'an. Because there's two thaqalain. Qur'an and itrati. And the itrati is the preserver of the true sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So you follow the sunnah, you have to follow itrati. They're synonymous, they're the same thing. The family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Imam Ali, he said, أَمَا تَرْضَ أَن تَكُونَ مِنِّي بِمَنْزِلِتِ هَارُونَ مِنْ مُوسَى غَيْرَ لَا نَبِيَ بَعْدِي أو كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ صَلَاةُ وَسَلَامُ حديث المنزلة He says, are you not pleased that you are to me as Aaron was to Moses, as Harun was to Musa alayhi salam. What was the relationship of Harun to Moses? It was his brother, it was his supporter, his friend, his beloved, the preserver of spiritual secrets, of sacred gnosis, of ma'rifah, right? This is the relationship. But who was the, the temporal successor of, of Musa alayhi salam? It was not Harun. It was Yusha bin Nun. You see? So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is the temporal successor of the Prophet ﷺ and also inherited many prophetic secrets. That's why many of the uh, turuq of tasawwuf comes from who? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. You go back 200 years ago. We we're just talking about this in the car, Dr. Ahmad. You go back 200 years ago, you'll be hard pressed to find a single scholar who did not follow a madhab of jurisprudence and a tariqah of tasawwuf. You will be hard pressed to find one. Salahuddin al Ayyubi was in a tariqah, he was murid, the liberator of Palestine. Abu Qasim al Junaid was a qadi in Baghdad. He was a man of tasawwuf, but he was a qadi, he was a faqih. Jalal al Din al Rumi was a qadi in Konya. We don't have this issue, we don't have this dichotomy of spirit and law. This is Christian baggage, we don't have this issue. It's not an absolute dichotomy. The sharia is a means by which we attain spirituality to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very, very important. So I want to tell a little bit about the story of Al Imam al Hussein, Sayyid al Shuhada, alayhi salam. He is the son of Ali, he is the son of Fatima al Zahra, the one about whom the Prophet وسلم, said, Fatima tu bid'atu minni. فَمَنْ أَغْضَبَهَا فَقَدْ أَغْضَبَنِي وَمَنْ أَغْضَبَنِي فَقَدْ أَغْضَبَ اللَّهِ أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام Fatima is a piece of my flesh. Fatima is a piece of my flesh. Whoever angers her has angered me. Whoever angers me angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the state of Fatima Zahra. I mentioned this story the other day. A few years ago I was in a masjid and I think it was Laylatul Qadr. We just prayed Tarawih. And my daughter ran up to me and she jumped on me and I hugged her. And another brother there said, you know, back in my country, you would have been slapped on, on the top of your head for, do, for, for, for doing this, for, for showing affection to your daughter. This is against our culture, right? I said, really? I said, yeah, my dad would have scolded, my father would have scolded you if he saw you do this. So do you know anything about the Prophet Sallallahu that when the Prophet ﷺ was sitting in a majlis and Fatima Zahra, who was a toddler, would walk into the majlis, he would stand up, Qama Rasulullah, stand for Fatima Zahra. And what? Kiss her on the hands and on the forehead. Who's better than the Prophet ﷺ? Nobody. Khayr al khalqillah. This is his love for children. This is how he manifested love for different people. So let's look at some of these uh, blessed. Uh, um, events in the life of Imam al Hussein, He is the epitome of the prophetic hadith, قُلْ الْحَقَّ وَنْ كَانَ مُرًّا Speak the truth even if it's bitter. وَلَا تَخَفِّ اللَّهِ لَوْمَ تَلَائِمْ 
and never be afraid of those who find fault. Don't be afraid of the opinions of men. Those are just human beings. Do what is right with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That doesn't mean have bad adab with people, have bad comportment with people, don't care about the feelings of people. No, that's against the sunnah. Right? But don't be afraid to stand up for what is right. Imam al Hussein did not fear human beings. Imagine the unbelievable sacrifice. Imagine it. Did not fear human beings. He did what was right for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Afdalul jihad. Man qala kalimata haqqin inda sultan in ja'ir. The greatest jihad is a word of truth in the face of a tyrant. He epitomizes this hadith, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He was born in 4 Hijri. He is the second son of Ali and Fatima. The ulama say that from the neck up, Imam Hassan looked like the Prophet. And from the neck down, Imam al Hussein looked like the Prophet. And that's in their khalq, the way they look physically. The Prophet ﷺ, he makes this amazing, ajeeb statement, which is in Al-Bazar and Hakim, in the Tabarani. It says, Husaynun minni wa ana min Husayn. We understand Husaynun minni. Husayn is from me, right? Because Husayn is the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ. How do we understand wa ana min Husayn? This is unbelievable. Subhanallah. Oh Allah, love those who love Hussein. So the ulama say that this means that they are aligned in their character, in their khuluq. He looks like the Prophet ﷺ in his khalq, and he has similar character in his khuluq, in his, inward aus- in his inward aspect, in his virtues, in his principle. He is similar or the same as the Prophet ﷺ. They also mention it means that he's the preserver of the Prophet's deen, of his legacy. And the Prophet ﷺ had intense love for his children and for his grandchildren. One time, Imam Hassan, he waited, the Prophet ﷺ was praying. Imam Hassan was a very young boy. The Prophet went down into a sajda. Imam Hassan jumps on the back of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ would not move until he was done. He kept in sajda. Right? And then after the prayer, he jumps on the Prophet ﷺ again and took him as a conveyance. You know, kids jump on the father's back, pretend like it's a game. You know, take me somewhere. So a man walked by and he said, Ni'mal al markab rakibti ya ghulam. What an excellent conveyance you've taken, O oh, little boy. And the Prophet said, Wa ni'ma rakibuhu. How excellent is the rider? Pointing to Imam Hassan. Salam. One time the Prophet was standing on the minbar delivering a khutbah on Friday. And Imam Hussein, very young, a toddler, following the voice of his grandfather, comes into the masjid. Right? The Prophet ﷺ sees him and he descends the minbar. During the khutbah, descends the minbar. And he picks up Imam Hussein and he hugs him. And he hugs that body that would be eventually trampled upon by horses by the army of Yazid. And he kisses the face, the face that's attached to the blessed severed head that is going to be smacked by Yazid sticks. Kisses his face. He reascends the minbar and finishes the khutbah with Imam Hussein in his arms. This is the love that the Prophet ﷺ had for Imam Hussein. He used to say, Inna ibni hadha. Indeed, this son of mine. Indeed, this son of mine. As an adult, Imam Hussein lived during a time of major tyranny, massive persecution of Ahlul Bayt. In Damascus, it was instituted as part of the khutbah liturgy. You know how we say there's a there's certain arkan of the khutbah. Right? Alhamdulillah, asla ala nabi, ittaqullah. Right? There's certain things you have to say in Arabic during the khutbah for the khutbah to be legitimate. One of the arkan of the khutbah of the Bani Umayyah in Damascus, and not all of the Bani Umayyah. Many of them ulama, they're awliya, we don't generalize. But this was the polity, this was state instituted. This is what you have to say in the khutbah or else you can't give khutbah, you can't be khatib. What else do you have to say? You have to send la'ana upon Imam Ali. This happened for 90 years in Damascus. 90 years as part of the khutbah liturgy. It's ajib and gharib. The, the nephew of the Prophet ﷺ, the one who preserves his lineage. This is what they're saying about him. This is the atmosphere in which Imam Hussein grew up. The Umayyad authorities also had these secret homeland security agents all around the empire. 
especially in Iraq, especially in Kufa. Why in Kufa? Because Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he became Khalifa in 656 of the Common Era, he moved the capital from Medina to Munawwara to Kufa. And it was a brilliant move. It gives him more of a central location to deal with growing problems in the north out of Syria with Umayyad. And uh, there was this menacing group of puritanical Muslims called Al Khawarij, who believed that anyone who didn't believe as they believed was a non Muslim and they could kill them and plunder them. Right? Puritanical fire and brimstone aqidah. So eventually, one of them accused Imam Ali of kufr. This is unbelievable. Right? And they made a pact in the haram in Mecca. In the haram in Mecca. Three of them said, I'm going to go kill Amr ibn al As, I'm going to kill Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, and you go kill Ali ibn Abi Talib. In Mecca, they shook on it. In Mecca, they go, the other two were not successful. But this one, Abdurrahman ibn Muradi al uh, uh, ibn Rahman, Abdurrahman uh, al Muradi al Mul, whatever his name is, he went into the masjid in Kufa, instructs Imam Ali, and killed him. The Prophet says in a hadith that Imam Suyuti relates in the Tariq al Khulafa. It's an ajib hadith. He says to him, that two individuals will have an extremely painful torment in the inferno, in the, in the hellfire. This hadith of, of the Prophet ﷺ, Tariq al-Khulafa, Jalaluddin al-Suyuti. Two individuals will have the most painful torment. The fair-skinned man of Bani uh, Thamud, who hamstrung the Naqatullah during the time of Salih salam, and the man, he's talking to Ali, and the man who is going to strike you here and this will be saturated with blood. So Imam Ali is walking out of the masjid according to Kitab al-Dhikr al-Mat wa ma ba'da by Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, book 40 of the Ihya. He's walking out of the masjid after praying Salat al-Fajr. And this man, Abdul Rahman al-Muradi, pounces on him, strikes him on the top of the head. And immediately his skull splits and blood pours down his face and saturates his beard. And he falls down and he screams, Fuztu wa rabb al-Ka'aba. Fuztu wa rabb al-Ka'aba. I have triumphed. I have won. I have gained victory by the Lord of the Kaaba. You, you've gained victory? You were killed by this man because he understands he's attained what? Istishhad. He's become a martyr. Alayhi salam. So, Imam Hussein uh, is in this type of environment. Now, there's also an interesting, interesting hadith that's mentioned in Imam Suyuti as well. That the Prophet ﷺ said to Ali, Ya Ali, la yuhibbuka illa mu'min, wa la yubghiduka illa munafiq. The, oh Ali, no one loves you except a believer, and no one hates you except a hypocrite. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri used to say, he said, Kunna na'rifan munafiqin fil Medina bi bughdihim Ali. We used to be able to tell who is a munafiq in Medina because they had hatred for Ali, aversion to Ali. Aversion to Ali is a sign of nifaq. Unfortunately, in some places, even today, you mention the name Ali, and Muslims have a visceral reaction. Muslims, we have to be very, very careful. Some of this vapor, as Sheikh Muhammad al Nidawi, may Allah preserve him, some of this vapor of those days has trickled down into our contemporary society regarding Imam Ali, alayhi salam. That you mention his name and people have a bad reaction to it. So at that time, you can imagine naming your son Ali had political ramifications because he's been cursed on the minbar of Bani Umayyah. They didn't even name their sons Ali. Imam Hussein names four of his sons Ali. Ali Akbar, Ali Asghar, Ali ibn Hussein Zainul Abidin. Four of his sons he names Ali. So any type of behavior that was even remotely perceived as, as subversive by the Umayyad polity was harshly dealt with. It was Umayyad foreign and domestic policy to hunt down and kill descendants of the Prophet Muhammad How pitiful. This is their foreign policy. Hunt down the family, the descendants of the Prophet Now interestingly, according to the ulama, when Muawiyah died, and we have respect for Sayyidina Muawiyah, min ashabi Rasulillah, Right? The Prophet ﷺ met Muawiyah, made dua for him. We have a good opinion of all of the Sahaba. When he died in 60 Hijri, there was a difference of opinion between him and Ali. Right? And Ali was on the right. Ultimately, that's what we believe as Ahlul Sunnah. Right? But we don't curse anyone. That's from the Ashabi Rasulillahi 
Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Difference of opinion based on ijtihad. When he died in 60 Hijri, his son Yazid succeeded him. And Muawiyah stipulated, according to Sunni and Shi'i tradition, Muawiyah stipulated in his final will, speaking to Yazid, that if Al Hassan ibn Al, Al Hussein ibn Ali does not give you bay'ah, let it go. Don't worry about it. Don't force the issue. It'd be extremely imprudent of you to do that. Just let it go. But Yazid has ego issues. Like many despotic tyrants of today, they, they don't want to give up power, like this man in Syria. He's not going to give, it's lost, he's not going to give it up. Doesn't want to give it up, right? Despotic tyrancy. So he's like a, an archetype of the Pharaoh, of the Fir'aun, right? So listen to what Allah, listen to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Fir'aun and think of it in terms of Bani Umayyah and Yazid and Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Fir'aun ala fir'art. That the Pharaoh has exalted himself on the earth. He thinks very highly of himself, the Pharaoh. Anna rabbukum al-a'la, he said. I am your Lord most high. The ulama say that the Pharaoh used to eat bananas all the time. Why? Because it makes you constipated. Because he didn't like to relieve himself, because he thought he was God. He thought it was beneath himself to re relieve himself. In the Fir'aun ala fir'art. Wa ja'ala ahlaha shi'a. And he turned his people into factions and denominations. Right? This is what he does. The Fir'aunic methodology, the Fir'aunic archetype, people under his dominion. The immediate reference is to the Egyptians. He, he divides them up into different denominations and then sends these shayateen in human form into the populace to sow seeds of corruption amongst the people. This is what he does according to the tafsir. Right? Take attention away from him, what he's doing. No, it's their fault. Fight amongst yourselves. It has nothing to do with me. Right? And then what does he do? Then he takes, according to the tafsir, he takes one ta'ifa, one group of the people under his dominion, and he really oppresses them. Okay? So with respect to the Pharaoh, this is who? Bani Israel. Because Bani Israel were talking about what? There's going to be a savior, a deliverer. Musa alayhi salam is going to come. He's going to drive us out of here. He's going to defeat the Fir'aun. So the Pharaoh is afraid of losing his temporal power, his kingdom, his political authority, right? So he takes the one group that he fears most rebellion from. With respect to Yazid, this is who? Ahl al-Bayt Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But then the Quran is very specific as to how he oppresses them. Yudhabihu abna'ahum. He kills their males. He hunts the men and kills them. nisa'ahum. And he leaves the women alive. Now the women, are dependent upon the very system that slaughtered their husbands and sons. He is of those who sow corruption in the earth. So it's just as Musa السلام, spoke truth to power, uh, Imam Hussein السلام, is going to speak truth to power. And when I say power, I'm talking about temporal power, perceived power. We're told in the Quran that from the Ali Fir'aun, there was a believer. Now we're not talking about Asiya alayhi salam. That was his wife. The Quran says, Rajulun mu'minun. Rajulun mu'minun. Mean Ali Fir'aun. There was a man from amongst his family that believed in Musa alayhi salam. And what does he say in the council? He says, Ya qawmi, lakumul mulk al yawm, zahirin fil ard. Today or this day, you have the mulk. Apparently, apparently you have the dominion, right? To the Fir'aun. But that's not bil haqiqa. Bil haqiqati walillahi mulku samawati wal ard. In reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the mulk. And the power is with Imam Hussein. And the power is with Musa alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, قُلْ لَا يَسْتَوِ الْخَبِيثِ وَالطَّيِّبِ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَكَ كَثْرَةُ الْخَبِيثِ They're not the same. Foul things and pure things. Even if the, the, the sheer numbers of the foul things should surprise you. Oh, there's so much of it, right? Think about Imam Hussein alayhi salam, 70 or so people surrounded by 30,000, 30,000 armed soldiers of Yazid. Truth is truth and falsehood is falsehood. So at this time, a letter arrives in Medina from Damascus. 
addressed to the governor of Medina, whose name is Al-Walid bin Uqba, and he tells his deputy, Marwan al-Hakam, who is a notorious person, that says, you have to force bay'ah from four men in Medina. Force them to make bay'ah. And he said, from two of them, you're going to have a little bit of issue. Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar. And from the other two, you're going to have a lot of issues. Abdullah ibn Zubair, Al-Husayn ibn Ali. And he says, but this last one, if he doesn't, doesn't give you bay'ah, then bring his head back to me. Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. So Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, he asks for a delay, and they say, you have until Fajr time. So in the night, he prepares to leave Medina, gathers his things with his family and his companions, and they leave. They leave Mecca, they leave Medina to go to Mecca, a reverse hijrah, which is what the future Mahdi will do, according to the ulama of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that he will be a refugee from Medina into Mecca, mimicking the future Mahdi. So he stays in Mecca for four months, seeking refuge in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And during this time, a flood of letters come into Mecca from all over the Muslim world, especially from Iraq, especially from Kufa, encouraging him to be our leader. You stand against injustice and tyranny and oppression. Be our leader because they knew, they knew that Imam Hussein would never ever pledge allegiance to open fasiq. It's impossible. He can't do that. He doesn't go against the Quran. There's an interesting hadith that is graded as sahih, that is quoted a lot by contemporary ulama. Sheikh Muhammad al nidawi quotes it a lot. Interesting hadith in which it says, Awalu, awalu man yubaddilu sunnati rajulun min Bani Umayyah. The first one to change my sunnah is a man from Bani Umayyah. And remember, the essence or the reality of the sunnah has always been preserved in Ahl al-Bayt, the itra. Right? So when we talk about the Sunnah, we're talking about Ahl al-Bayt. They're inseparable. That's how we reconcile our two hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, Man tamassaka bi sunnati inda fasadi ummati falahu ajru, falahu ajru mi'ati shaheed, aw kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. Whoever holds fast to my Sunnah during the time of the corruption of my Ummah will have the reward of 100 shuhada, 100 martyr witnesses. Holds fast to my Sunnah, which is never detached from itrati from the family of the Prophet ﷺ. They preserve the sunnah. In Bukhari and Muslim, man raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni. Whoever turns away from my sunnah is not from me. Again, when we think about sunnah, we have to think about Ahlul Bayt. Whoever turns away from the Ahlul Bayt, who is Ahlul Bayt? Imam Hussein. Falaysa minni. He's not from me. Falaysa minni. Husseinun minni. Wa ana min Hussein. Subhanallah. What an, what an unbelievable statement from the Prophet ﷺ. Hussein is from me, and I am from Hussein. So Hajj season begins, and many agents of Yazid, they come into Mecca as hujaj. They're wearing ihram, and they have weapons under the ihram. Think about this. Coming into Mecca with ihram during Hajj season to do what? To kill the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ. It's really ajib. And the Imam, alayhi salam, he cuts short his hajj and decides to leave Mecca. And the question, why leave Mecca? Because according to the ulama, the second thaqal cannot violate the first thaqal. The, f- the second weight, the itra, cannot violate the Quran. Innahuma lan yatafarraqa. They're never going to deviate from one another. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ دَخَلَهُ كَانَ amina." Whoever enters the sacred precincts is safe. So Imam Hussein alayhi salam, in order to preserve the sanctity of Mecca, he sets off into the desert, knowing his fate, knowing what's going to happen to him. And he took women and children with him. And the question is, why take women and children if you know you're going to be massacred? Why do that? And the ulama say, the ummah was sleeping. They needed to be shaken out of their, what? Ghafla, heedlessness. Complacency. The sunnah is being changed. The family, the family of the Prophet is being hunted down and killed. So imagine, as our ulama say, that he had only taken the men. He only took the men. Then the Yazidi propaganda, right, would have said what? Yeah, he, he came out and we had a flag of peace, but he attacked us. Because they would have killed all the men and buried them and then make, make up a story about it. Very easy. He attacked us, 
And unfortunately, he was killed in a skirmish. It was friendly fire. Um, it's too bad, right? So Imam Hussein takes women and children because ultimately it was the women and children who would tell the truth about Karbala. It was them who would tell the truth about what happened on that day. People like Asayyid Zainab in the court of Yazid speaking truth to power, this type of shuja'a, this type of courage. There's a poem here by Mu'in al-Din al-Chisti. It's a quatrain in Farsi. He says, Shah has Hussein, Padishah has Hussein, Din has Hussein, Din Pana has Hussein. Sardad nada dasta dasta Yazid. Said, Hussein is king, Hussein is emperor, Hussein is religion, he's the hope of religion. He gave his head, not his hand, into the hand of Yazid. Ajib. So approximately 70 kilometers from Kufa, they come to a desert called Karbala, and the Imam and his followers find themselves surrounded by the army of Yazid. Now this is very interesting. There is hadith that mention this event. And these are hadith again. All of the hadith I'm quoting to you is hadith of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And sometimes when I quote these hadith, I have to make a faith confession. You can say, oh, maybe this guy is a Shi'i or something. Right? No, I'm Hanafi, I'm Maturidi, I'm Ba'alawi in my tariqah, Sunni. These are hadith in our books. This hadith and the mustadrak of Al-Hakim, sound hadith, rigorously authenticated hadith, Related by Umm Salama, radiallahu ta'ala anha, Umm al-Mu'mineen, the Prophet sallam, was in her quarters and he was sleeping. Baja'a, he's lying down. Istayqadha faj'atan. Then he suddenly woke up and he was very bothered by something. And then he went back to sleep. And then istayqadha again, he woke up again. Went back, to, and this happened three times. And she says on the third time, she says, Thumma istayqadha wa fi yadihi sharifa turbatun hamra. He woke up a third time and in his hand was some red soil, yuqabbiluha, and he's kissing it. And she said, what is this? And he said, Jibril alayhi salam told me some devastating news that this son of mine, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, will be slaughtered in a place called Karbala, and this is the dust from the place. This is Sahih Hadith. Another Hadith of the Musnad of Abu Ya'la, related by Abdullah ibn Nujay, he says that he heard from his father that he was walking with Imam Ali, they were going to Safin on the banks of the Euphrates River. And Imam Ali was walking by the river and he started to shout, Sabran, Ya Aba Abdullah. Sabran, Ya Aba Abdullah. Who's Abu Abdullah? This is the patronym of who? Imam Hussein. So Nujay says, What are you talking about? And Imam Ali says, That I walked into the room of the Prophet one day and tears were streaming, streaming down his face. And I said, What's wrong? Ya Rasulullah. And he said that Jibril alayhi salam gave me the news that this son of mine, Hussein alayhi salam, will be slaughtered on the banks of the Euphrates River. This hadith according to the books of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, our books. So for several days, I know I'm running out of time. I think I'm already out of time. Am I out of time? So we'll conclude inshallah ta'ala. For several days, the army of Yazid tried to force allegiance from Hussein by cutting off their water supply which is a tactic of you know, the military industrial complex of Yazid. You know, if you don't agree with us, you're not going to eat, you're not going to drink, we're going to cripple your economy. They did this to the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, right? The Muqata'a of Bani Hashim, right? Don't trade with them, don't give them food, go live in the desert, right? This torture and cruelty, but today we call it sanctions. You don't agree with us, you're not going to eat. That's torture. Right? No, it's, it's a much better sanctions, right? It's not massacre, it's collateral damage. Shock and awe campaign, right? This type of thing. So, we won't go into specifics as to what actually happened on Yomi Ashura. We know what happened to Ali Akbar and Ali Asghar, Zainul Abidin, Al Abbas and Hur and Muslim bin Aqil before and Zainab and Sukaina and Fatima. We know about Ibn Ziyad, Ibn Sa'ad and Shimr and all these things. The main point is that the ta'aziyah, the passion narrative of Imam Hussein is metamorphic. It's meta-trans-historical. It's meta-historical. In other words, the army of Yazid, according to one of the liberation theologians, is a floating signifier. Imam Hussein represents anyone who says no to tyranny and injustice. While Shimr and Yazid represent any militant thug who rapes and murders and tortures and colonizes. 
So we see a lot of Husseini archetypes. Malcolm X, for example. Think about this in the 1960s, how racist people were in the 1960s. People are still racist, never gone away. Going on a television show surrounded by nothing but white Americans, grilling him on things. That's a mujahid, fi sabilillah. Right? Standing up to the racism and oppression. That's a Husseini archetype. Martin Luther King, Husseini archetype. Rachel Corey, this woman who stands in front of an Israeli bulldozer to protect a Palestinian home. And she was callously and barbarically killed by this bulldozer. Husseini archetypes. Anyone who says no. Imam Hussein sacrificed his life to set a trans-historical example. Not to vicariously atone for the sins of humanity, as in Christianity, no but rather to give us an example of virtue by which to live in this life and to have success in the next life. InshaAllah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.